Now we have a combination of pre-recorded videos uh, to present uh, together with live presentations today. We're going to kick off uh, with Douglas Goodall, our senior trials officer, giving us a background uh, overview to the trial site. Um, and then we'll move on to uh, Professor uh, Fiona Burnett. Uh, Fiona is head um, of applied plant pile pathology at SRUC, and she'll be reviewing the current uh, fungicide season uh, and uh, looking at uh, how we've applied our technology in light of the diseases that we've faced this year. Uh, Dr. Steve Hode, who leads on crop improvements, has kindly pre-recorded an infield review of his 10 varieties of particular interest, and we'll be looking at those. And he joins us after briefly for a, uh, a catch-up uh, in the webinar with a summary of what he presented. Uh, we're then going to take a closer look at uh, beneficials and IPM with Dr. Lorna Cole and Dr. Henry Creason before we round off the event with a look ahead to the forthcoming crop marketing season with principal con SAC consultant Julian Bell. Uh, hopefully that should leave us time uh, for a, a Q&A session at the end. Um, and we've got a slide here that uh, just shows you how you might ask those questions. Um, do you feel free to post questions during the webinar via the Q&A tab. If we don't get around to answering them during the session, then we'll um, raise them in the open panel at the end. And if that fails, we'll, we'll email you answers after the event. Uh, Craig, my colleague, is controlling things in the background. And if you have any private questions, you can message him using the chat uh, button. Um, so we've got a few polls um, just to liven up the event. We've got four polls um, throughout the hour or so that we're going to be on. Uh, if you'll kindly partake, it'll just give us a bit of feedback. Um, this is the first poll question. So uh, compared to this time last year, what are your current wheat harvest yield expectations? And I think um, as a region, we were probably down 5% in yield on uh, 2019, and it wasn't so much the fact that yields were awful. I think it's just we couldn't get that much in the ground. So if you would like to click on your responses, um, and after we've had a look at the uh, results that come back, we'll go to our first uh, video, um, which is Douglas Goodall, who's our senior trials officer, giving us a background to the uh, trial site at Coldshill. Hello and welcome to Coldshill Farm here in East Lothian. My name is Douglas Goodall and I am the site manager for the trials. Coldshill Farm is a family farm managed by Keith and Scott Maxwell. The farm extends to approximately a thousand acres, mainly arable, but livestock numbers have increased over the last few years. Coldshill averages about 160 metres above sea level. The soil is mainly medium loam very uniform, which is ideal for trial work on this Humvee series soils. A brief history of what the trials have had so far. The wheat crop behind me is a first wheat after winter oil seed rate and was sown into near perfect in seedbed conditions on the 29th of September. All the plots were sown at 360 seeds per square metre. The trial was rolled the same day. Emergence was after 17 days and growth was very good during the wet autumn and winter. Unfortunately, this wet weather prevented any herbicide or P and K being applied in the autumn. So my first task in the spring was to control the grass and broadleaf weeds. Although levels of weeds were much lower this year, a fell at 0.6 litre per hectare with biopower and 20 grams of harmony have done a very good job. This was applied in the first week in March along with nitrogen phosphate and potassium. A total of 200 kilograms of nitrogen was applied to the trials split three ways, along with 24 kilograms of sulphur. This was applied at the middle application. The PLUS fungicide trials will receive a four spray program at the main time ends. Growth regulators this year include MODIS at 0.2 and 1.75 litres of 3C cycacel at growth stage 30, and was followed up with Terpol at 0.6 litres per hectare at gross stage 35. 
The majority of the trials is variety testing with 48 RL varieties in this year's trial. There are approximately 140 other varieties being evaluated for yield and disease resistance. Other trials on the site include seven fungicide trials looking at new and old chemistry, dose rates, timings and mixtures. There are also two fertiliser trials looking at varieties, rates, timings, solid and liquid fertilisers. Disease levels in the wheat this year are fairly low at the moment with uh, trace levels of septoria, yellow rust and mildew. Moving to the spring barley, a crop that is in the ground less than half the time of the winter wheat, this was sown into a good seed bed on March the 22nd. Emergence was the slowest I have recorded, taking almost 24 days to come through the ground. This was mainly due to the extreme cold, frosty weather at the time. This was then accompanied by a very dry period after sowing. There are 25 aerial spring barley varieties being tested this year. The barley will receive a two-spray programme applied at 30-31 and again at 50-55. 120 kilograms of nitrogen was applied, split 50-50 to the seedbed, then grow stage 12. The trial also received 60 kilograms of P and K and 15 kilograms of sulphur. Routine sprays include manganese applied twice at growth stage 15 and again at growth stage 30. There was a high flush of weeds that included many of the polygonums and fumitory, so my choice of herbicide was harmony at 60 grams per hectare and high load mercam at 1 metre per hectare, and this has made an excellent job of controlling the main weeds. There is also fertiliser trials looking at rates and timings and solid and liquid fertilisers. Overall, I am very pleased with the trials considering the poor weather conditions at times. I would say both crops are about 7 to 10 days behind average growth here in late May, but I am confident Mother Nature will do its bit and the crop will catch up and give us a near normal harvest time as some sunnier, warmer weather is forecasted. Both crops at the moment have the potential to produce good yields. Hopefully there will be some good sunshine during, during the grain filling period. That's great. Um, and thank you uh, to Douglas for giving us that overview. I wonder, Craig, did, did we have the uh, results from that uh, first poll? Okay, so 10% um, better, 36%. Uh, 20% better, uh, 27 of us are thinking we're going to be 27, 20% better, and uh, a small proportion of us think uh, we're going to be 30% uh, better. Um, so uh, perhaps uh, not a surprise, uh, given the fact that um, those crops that established well uh, last autumn uh, do seem to have uh, good potential going forward. Um, Okay, before we talk to uh, Fiona, uh, I'm just going to put up the next um, uh, poll um, slide. And uh, we're asking you, uh, seeing as we're talking about fungicides now, was it a season for you to apply the new fungicide chemistry? Um, we're thinking along the lines of Revastar and Univoc here, uh, just to give us an idea as to the disease pressure that um, uh, we felt we were under this season. Um, okay, we'll leave that one with you. Uh, I'm going to talk now to uh, Fiona Burnett. Uh, Fiona is Professor of Applied Plant Pathology and Head of Knowledge Exchange and Impact at SRUC. Um, hi, Fiona. Hi, Mark. Hi. Nice to be here today. Uh, good, good. Um, I dare say it hasn't been the most challenging of seasons for fungicides yet. Um, we, we haven't seen a, an early surge of septoria for sure. Um, if I could hand over to you uh, for further insight um, as to how you've used the season to date, that'd be great. Thanks, Mark. Yeah, that was a bit of a spoiler that we're not looking at loads of disease um, this year, but then that's one of the challenges that we have to deal with every year um, is how to modify what we're doing. Um, so I'll just try and share some slides with you now. Is that coming through okay, Mark? Yes, that's fine. Uh, you could maximise the screen. Uh, potentially, okay. there you go. Yep. Great. 
So, yeah, I mean, yet again, we're talking about another season of extremes. So we lurch between, you know, coldest, wettest, driest. It's been the first season that we've had uh, the new active Univoc, uh, fenpicoximide, so previously known as Inatrec. And it's obviously, you know, it's the second season we've had Revastar, um, which is the new azole, Mephen trifluconazole, which I've been practicing saying for two years now. Um, so probably not the most pressured season to be trying new actives in, but keen to hear your experience of that. So really just to explore today how the season's been playing out and then think about what our key challenges are going forward and how we can begin to take some of the guesswork out of, of what we're doing. So that's just a few weather maps to illustrate. I mean, we had this, you know, very wet uh, winter period um, followed by a dry spring. And the dry spring there, like all averages, isn't really showing you um, the detailed picture. So we went to this exceptionally dry April. So you see large areas of the country with no rainfall whatsoever for a whole month. And then true Scottish style, you see normal service begin to resume in May. And we now have, you know, quite a wet um, flowering period for the wheat crops. Again, the, you know, cooler temperatures, uh, you know, Douglas referred to these in his video as well. But, you know, perhaps it wasn't as cold as perceptions. It was certainly a lot colder than last year, a colder than average winter and then the spring more or less um, normal. But that, you know, com combination of cool and dry held back um, crop growth. So, you know, when we look at the average growth stages a year ago, when they began to move into growth stage 30 and stem extension, that was generally around the end of April. And we were around two to three weeks later at that timing this year. And again, the, you know, cool temperatures uh, and swings in temperature that we've had since both over T1 and T2 has been quite stressful for crops. So in the, the crop clinic, while we're not seeing high levels of disease, we have been quite seeing quite a lot of stress uh, related symptoms and, you know, some scorches and things. So, yeah, broadly, septoria levels still very low, which, you know, has obviously meant modifications to what people have been doing in practice. Uh, a little bit of mildew out there and really yellow rust being one of the kind of conversation points. So, again, it was a relatively slow burn. Yellow rust is a kind of key driver of our T0 inputs. It didn't appear very widely early on, but it was around the coast in a few crops. And we know that the, you know, the different races tend to vary about the country. So it makes it quite unpredictable which varieties behave well and which, you know, um, succumb. We certainly saw fewer T knots being used and the T1 inputs were generally reduced. Um, they tended to include more SDHIs than previously. And I think that's just an acknowledgement that we have less chlorothalonil activity. Well, we have no chlorothalonil out there. So, you know, there was a perception that more had to be done at, at T1s in terms of the, the mixtures. Uh, and obviously there was Phoenix used at that time as well. But inputs, doses tended to be lower. And some people have even went as far as emitting a T0. And we were anticipating crops to grow very rapidly to T2, but actually that was also late. So that dry period pushed um, the flag leaf timings out as well. And that seems to be where yellow rust has hopped into some of the gaps. So the modifications at flag leaf, and that clearly is our most responsive timing. Um, but here you see, you know, the, the fungicide performance graph. So we've not been able to present the, the Univoc uh, curves before because it wasn't on the market uh, at winter workshops. Um, but thinking about the dose rate, here we're looking at septoria in an eradicant scenario. So you can see there's quite a lot of flexibility in terms of dose for the older products, the Ascra and Elatus. Not old, old, but I mean, they're the best of the previous, if you like. And then we've got Revistar and Univoc showing very similar uh, efficacy. Um, but in an eradicant situation, you're having to come quite far up the dose, three quarters or more, to really get good efficacy. But if we think about where we were this year in a protectant scenario, you can see how those curves move back. Um, and we would be much closer to perhaps even a half dose uh, in terms of managing septoria in a protectant scenario. Clearly, if you're on, and I, th I think there will have been a lot of 
um, the more established chemistry used this year, given, you know, just acknowledging the lower pressure, um, you would have to be further up the dose rates. So again, more like the three quarter dose um, to get that efficacy. And yield, the curves here are putting together both the eradicant and the protectant scenarios in their data set. Um, so again, you tend to see that it's the three quarter rate or above um, where we're tending to be working in, if you like, an average season, which clearly we never get. So given what I've just said, you know, slightly back on doses in a, in a more protectant um, scenario as we've seen this year. And I've shown this um, data set before, but I mean, exploring this idea that how do we begin to second guess where the risks are if we reduce fungicide inputs? So what I've got here is if you think of a high risk scenario of a susceptible variety early drilled, and you can see there are the risks. If you cut back, we've got low, moderate or high input uh, fungicide programs and then the output um, values. So if you make the wrong decision and you cut uh, your inputs in this scenario, you can see that there's quite a significant penalty. But actually, when you move to a more resistant variety or to the lower risk scenarios, um, you know, the risk that comes with cutting back is just reduced. And I think that is just such an obvious way of reducing some of the, the headache that comes to deciding uh, on our inputs to wheat programmes. We have you know, clearly a lot of challenges and risks going forward. This is our first season um, without chlorothalonil. We also know we're dealing with a higher backdrop of SDHI um, resistance. And again, fortunately, a lower pressured situation means we've been able to take that in our stride. Um, you know, these impacts, if we look at these, this is predicting the, the high and medium risk withdrawal products. So we've got risks around herbicides and insecticides in particular, and some of the fungicides, um, if we think of the easels that we anticipate we'll lose. So these sort of predicted losses to the value of output in arable crops uh, are not insignificant. We're clearly not as badly off as, as some sectors um, but that is another reason why we have to think of more resilient ways of, of managing crops going forward. There's a lot of emerging interest in you know, where plant nutrition uh, interweaves with plant health. So again, for example, this year where people have been feeding crops more regularly and we've not had spikes in nitrogen, the, the appearance of, of lower disease um, seems to be emerging. Here um, in this picture, we're looking at um, testing for sugars um, using BRICS meters, which again is an emerging area of interest, which we hope to see more about in winter meetings. Um, but maybe again, just to say that this year, what we're finding is sugar levels in, in wheat being slightly lower. And really that's probably a factor of it being cooler. So broadly light levels are the same and photosynthesis um, has gone the same. But the demand for crop growth is, is slower, it is much reduced. So just to finish on a few points now, we've moved to wet and humid conditions over flowering and ripening, which is not great when it comes to ear diseases. So just remember the mycotoxin risk assessments and to get them completed um, before harvest. And yeah, interested in what Steve will present, but the resistant varieties really is a key way that we can take some of the headache out of fungicide choices and be more secure in where we reduce um, doses and inputs to crops. We know that the resistance and CTL loss would have been more evident in a more pressured season. So, you know, at the moment, uh, programmes are coping very well and some of the lower input programmes are coping quite well uh, as well. Um, and yes, we, we recognise that early drilling will always feature, but going forward into next season, just recognise that as a risk. And they will certainly be scenarios where you would want to look at the more resistant varieties. So thanks for that, Mark. That concludes what I was, I was going to say, and I will stop sharing my slides now. That's great. Thank you, Fiona. And um, interesting what you're saying there about reducing risk uh, an IPM and we've seen uh, the rapid detection testing for septoria sort of in use this season have what's the sort of feedback you've got on how well that sort of embedded itself in 
in making decisions? I, yeah, no, it's a really interesting concept that you can test in real time. And broadly, it's pulled out what we think we know that early drilling, you know, we've seen slightly more um, septoria and that as we move through the season, the difference in, in resistant varieties tend to pull out. So when you're testing early in the season, it's been more about drilling date. I think, you know, the septoria, that, that feeling that the more intelligence you have, it's never a bad thing. There will probably be other examples, um, perhaps around barley diseases, where it is a more um, intelligent choice to think about what fungicides we can, can actually take out. So say spring barleys and drink sporium. If we really knew the crop was clean, we could think more about that. I suspect septoria will be ever present and we will still be sticking with our traditional timings but we could probably modify those based on those types of diagnostics. And do you think the T3 is sort of, is a given or is that very much the variety dependent um, this season? I think for us, the T3 serves two purposes. So we generally tend to be still managing septoria and retaining green leaf at that timing. And we're trying to manage the risk of ear diseases. And the risk of ear diseases this year is still there. So we're reliant on the easels at that timing. Um, there's probably scope to, you know, recognise the septoria risk is lower. Um, and there's a bit of, again, people are modifying their, their inputs there to add in a bit of um, stabilurin. Um, particularly where we've got yellow rust still in crops. So that's just one that's been bubbling away as well, Mark. Okay, okay. Well, I think we've got the results from the poll, um, if mm -hmm. Craig can put them up just out of interest to see. So that's surprising. Uh, surprising to you or maybe not, Fiona? Interesting and slightly surprising, yes, Mark. So, mm -hmm. you know, I think that's a nice feature that people have still been prepared to try um, new chemistry for the first time this mm, year. Mm. I suppose um, that's supported so, by the fact that prices are pretty strong. So uh, yeah. get get what you can. <clears throat> Absolutely. No, that's it. Would be good to explore whether people used a bit modified doses in the Q and A. So maybe people could add a few comments or questions around that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Fiona. Okay. Well, we'll we'll move on and. Uh, I'll come back to you in the Q&A session. Um, before we go on to Steve's presentation on the varieties, that's the uh, main main event, so to speak, of today, one more quick uh, poll for you to um, populate, um, and then we'll get the results up after Steve's presentation. So uh, just looking at what the market is uh, you're growing for, and uh, I mean, we know sort of 80% of what we grow here in Scotland is sort of targeted towards the uh, soft group three and soft group fours. It'd be interesting to see if we've got that sort of represented here today. So I'll leave that one with you um, and uh, we'll, we'll go to Steve's video, um, which is uh, looking at uh, his 10 top varieties for consideration uh, that he finds of particular interest at the moment. Hello, T today we are in East Lothian at SIUC's main wheat recommended list and uh, national list site. And as part of our events for this summer, I'm just gonna be updating on some top choices. So for winter wheat and a bit later on spring barley. So what we'll do now is, is give a top 10 that covers the main markets and certainly the, the seed area for the, the, the coming autumn and possibly for the next uh, two to three years. So in the top 10 winter wheat varieties, eight of them are either medium or good for grain distilling. So we're very much focusing on the main market uh, locally. What I'll do is flag up across several NABIM sectors some main varieties that you'll be familiar with, but also some, some new varieties to look out for, for sowing this autumn. So if we start with the NABIM group four, the soft feed varieties, here we can consider in the top 10, KWS Jackal, Annihilation. 
So these are a fairly uh, long standing with us now. They've um, done a, a really good job on farm. Yields are still very good and very consistent. But both varieties tend to have a, a low yield when untreated now. So disease resistance is beginning to look a, a little bit tired. So of the two side by side, elation is the slightly the stronger with the stiffer straw and the, the slightly better grain quality. Another variety which has become a mainstay now for us is LG Skyscraper. So when this came along, it was quite clear that it, that it had a, a yield advantage over other soft feed and distilling varieties. And interestingly, Skyscraper also has relatively early maturity. So that's a fantastic combination that certainly suits wheat growers uh, throughout uh, Scotland. Skyscraper also has a, a very good uh, specific weight, which is another uh, measure of uh, resilience or, or, or stability uh, in, in performance. So both KWS Jackal, Elation and uh, Skyscraper also do well in the second wheat slot. So that's something worth um, considering. So I'll mention another soft feed variety that suits distilling. So uh, another in the in the um, nabbing group four category, and that's a new variety called Swallow. So th this looks um, very interesting. It's another early maturing variety with um, stiff straw and it its yield looks uh, very promising and untreated yield is also relatively good. So to finish on the Nabin Group 4 soft varieties, KWS Jackal, Elation, then uh, we've also got LG Skyscraper and uh, Swallow. So that will be the, the, the top four from the, that particular category. We can also consider distilling varieties that are in NABIM Group 3 or the biscuit making category. So in this category, we've got the established uh, illicit, which is rated uh, good for distilling. So this is a, a versatile variety that suits both of those markets uh, extremely well, biscuit making and distilling. Now what's interesting in this category is that we've got three new entries and I'd like to refer to uh, all of them today as potential for both biscuit making and distilling. All three come from the, the same breeding company. They look promising in terms of yield and or quality and with new data from this harvest, we'll get a good idea of how best to position them. So first of all, we have LG Illuminate. Now of the three, this is the slightly higher yielding uh, variety at, at 102 on, on average. Then we've got LG Prince, which within the three is intermediate for yield. And then a variety that I'm standing by here uh, to, to my left is LG Astronomer. Its yield looks just a little bit behind at the moment, but this variety does look the most vertical in terms of drilling slot, both early and late. So that, that's something um, to, to, to bear in mind. All varieties look as though they will do well uh, in the earlier drilling slot. So that, that's something that I, I think gives us uh, versatility, particularly in the south of, of Scotland. What's also interesting about these three newcomers is that they're also relatively good in terms of resistance to Septoria triticae. So I think we're gonna see this emerging as, as a key trait that's getting uh, improvement year on year now. So those four, the top uh, four in the biscuit category, also suit distilling. We've got Illicit, uh, LG Illuminate, uh, LG Prince, and uh, LG uh, Astronomer. So I'll finish the, the top 10 with two feed varieties. One is a, is a soft wheat, but it doesn't suit distilling. It's RGT Saku. 
Now we've got this on the list because it's got a, an interesting combination of agronomic features, including above average um, uh, untreated yield. So we think that that might add uh, value with it within the portfolio. It's relatively late maturing, so, so do bear that in mind. But as a good second wheat, relatively good untreated yield, we think that has a place in our top 10. And to finish, we've got an out and out hard um, feed variety called SY Insider. This is in fact the highest yielding variety on the Scottish recommended list. So it's one, if you do want a real kind of barn filler at 105 on the, on the, on, on the yield um, performance. So just bear that one in mind, very good in terms of growing quality. Uh, uh, that's Hagberg um, falling number uh, and, and specific weight. Untreated yield, it does need a little bit of looking after, but certainly it's been very consistent in the treated yield slots in the trials over the past two or three years. Well, that's super. Uh, thank you very much, Steve. Um, uh, and Steve's going to join us uh, now with a summary slide just to pull together uh, the varieties that uh, he was discussing earlier in the pre-recording. Um, are you there, Steve? Yeah, here, here Mark. Well done. OK. <laughs> Um, if, if there's anything to, to follow up, you know, pe people can um, can get in touch about what we've included and perhaps what's not uh, on the on the top ten. But but here is a, is a summary, the main points um, to to take away. Uh, do you just want to run through those quickly, then, Steve? Just uh, just picking up on a few specifics. Yeah, well, in terms of the the seed uh, availability, then then there's a lot of effort into developing um, skyscraper. But as I said, the the established Alation and Jackal still have a place because of their, their consistency on on farm. And and I mentioned um, swallow as well because th th this does look interesting in terms of its yield, but also like skyscraper is um, relatively early maturing. And also the, the stiff straw is, is, is added value. So I think that's something um, that, that, that does look uh, of interest. And the fact it's from a, a different breeding company again is, you know, I think adds value to the portfolio. And then on the, the biscuit varieties there, it's interesting that, that there's quite a lot of material coming along that does combine biscuit and distilling use. So the, um, the three new ones there, Illuminate, Prince and Astronomer, have all got a medium rating um, for distilling. And, and, and they do look quite versatile in terms of their, their position at sowing time. So they're, they're all pretty good sort of uh, early sowing, but Astronomer looks even more versatile and it suits a very wide range of, of sowing times. So a strong one, not quite as uh, high yielding as, as, as Illuminate, but, but certainly with um, good growing quality is, is something to, uh, to look out for. And um, you know, I, I'm hoping that all three have a, ha have a place over the, over the coming years. And then just to complete the list, I've added a couple of non-distilling ones. So the Insider is, is probably the best of the of the hard nabbing group fours for, for, for feed. It, it does need um, care because of the um, untreated yield is, is, not, is not so good, but, but certainly um, in trials, it's been consistently a, a, a top performer in the untreated yield slot. And it, and it does bring um, excellent specific weight um, for, a, 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 for a feed variety. So that, that's, that's the best of those. And then um, RGT Saki, um, we added this one just because it had some features that um, uh, perhaps are not, um, not uh, present in some of the other choices. So Sasaki is uh, relatively good for the uh, untreated yield uh, as a soft variety. And, um, you know, I think it's something that um, just adds a bit of um, versatility within the uh, cho choices. Do bear in mind it's a little bit later maturing, so it has that sort of revelation 
um, lateness. So it won't suit everyone, but but certainly as a as a, an all rounds of feed feed variety, um, then that that would be one of the um, choices to to consider. Yeah, very interesting. I mean, I think um, it, it'll be interesting if any of the uh, people listening in have issues with straw quality on any of these varieties. I certainly. You know, Crusoe, not that it's grown up here that much, but was was a pretty tricky customer in terms of dealing with the straw um, that, you know, it was a great group one. But if you're uh, direct drilling or min tilling, um, you know, you, you might end up growing uh, something else just because of the issues it gave you. Um, do put that in chat if it's uh, 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 become an issue with you with any of these. Um, we did have one uh, query. Um, uh, from from uh, somebody, uh, Steve, have you any experience with MV Fredericia? Uh, I haven't heard that one myself. No, it's it's been a, around um, for a while, and we, we've got no no direct I I experience of it yet. So that that's one from a again, it, it comes from a different um, breeding program, and my understanding is that there's. It's very much um, well. The information is very much from from the commercial trials, um, rather than sort of the the, the official uh, variety trials. And the follow up question is why no spring wheat variety trials? Is that because that variety is a spring wheat? <laughs> well, um, acro across the across the UK, the number of spring trials is relatively low. So we're often relying then on um, information that, that comes from, um, from much, much further south. So, so, so the database is much, um, is, is much smaller than for the, for, for, for the winter counterpart. Um, yes, I mean, there's been a certainly a resurgence, uh, perhaps in spring wheat, as an option uh, for some growers. So it's maybe something we should be looking at. Uh, well, well there's certainly in national listing, that, that there's quite a lot of Varieties coming through, so so it's something that we could, um, you know, we, we could um, put a little bit more effort into uh, amongst our um, sort of con consultancy colleagues and and, and and their clients. You know, whether whether it's worth investigating this a bit more if we thought that they had a good, uh, you know, a good place in in yeah. the rotation. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and the next question that ties in with something that I was thinking about uh, asking you uh, is a question from Phil uh, McIntosh. Uh, is barrel finished? And I, and, and I was going to ask, uh, we've talked about the varieties that are up and coming. Um, have, are we losing any just because they're breaking down now? Uh, or should, should we should be wary of in terms of uh, resistance breaking down? Yeah, well, it's as varieties um, begin to move towards um that, that their way out so that there's a number of features it, it could be because of agronomic characteristics it's it's often because of a, a of a market or a lack of market interest or or even um a reduced um seed seed area so it's so a barrel with us is still um a fully recommended variety but i i just didn't add it as as within the the top 10 i gave chance to the to, to the newer ones but there's certainly still interest in in barrel. It's it's still relatively good in terms of its yield, and it's, it is in fact the highest yielding of, of the biscuit varieties. But I think it's um it, it's probably time to think of more varieties that have got both biscuit and distilling, whereas barrel uh, does doesn't have that. Okay. So they will still be interested in it. But I, I think um, if if certainly for, if LG illuminates. Um, makes progress then, then and i think that that could be very competitive um in, in relation to that and um, to, to, to the use of barrel and even elicits um in, in the future well let's have a look at the result of the poll uh, just to see if that um, gives uh, uh, an indication um uh, your opinion of that steve yeah it it, it kind of re reflects the fact that the the, the you know the, the top ten is is dominated by those two, two two key sectors, and and I think it's it's also reflects that um, that the breeders are doing a, a pretty good job in producing varieties that um, suit our conditions, and so so yep so, so I think those those things do do tie in 
And um, yeah, interesting that um, hard, hard group four, that there is interest there. And I think we've often had comments, um, you know, we'd, we'd quite like um, uh, an early maturing hard feed wheat, you know, something a bit like a, a, a Diego or a Cordial. Um, so we'll, we'll keep a lookout for those varieties as, as they come through, you know, so an early maturing sort of Diego type or, or, um, or Cordial type would suit us well, as long as it um, doesn't have any issues with, with, with seed set. Yeah, okay. That's great. Thank you very much, Steve. Well, okay. if anybody has any questions for Steve, um, in the meantime, do do po post them on the Q&A uh, and we'll pick them up later in the uh, at the end of the session. Thank you, Steve. Yeah, thanks very much. Thank you. Um, we'll now move on to um, our integrated pest management IPM session. Uh, and first up is, uh, Dr. Lorna Cole. Uh, good afternoon, Lorna. Thank you for joining us. Um, and you have a presentation for us um, on the role of beneficials. Yes. Thank you, Mark. Hopefully everyone can see my screen okay? I can, yes, yes. So as Mark said, I'm going to talk to you about beneficial insects and the role they play in integrated pest management. I guess the most important thing is that we can recognize beneficial insects and it's not always as easy as you might think. So a little game to start with is I'm going to show you some pests or beneficials and if people could contribute in the chat as to whether they think this is a pest or a beneficial, that would be fantastic. So just either a P for pest and a B for beneficial or the full word. So this is our first creature. And can you see the responses in your chat or do you want me to yes, tell you, Laura? Yes, I can. We've got okay. Ian thinking it's pest. So we've got a couple of people thinking it's pest. Any advance on a pest? Pest beneficial? Grant? Um, Grant's right. This little person here is a lacewing larvae. And these guys are hugely beneficial. They absolutely adore munching on aphids. Um, they also, some species, have a rather Macar behaviour in that they carry about the aphid skeleton, so it's a little bit silence of the lambs. So they hollow out the husk and they carry about the aphid skeletons on their back. The reason we think they do it is so they can go unnoticed by ants. So quite often ants will tend aphid colonies to get the honeydew, so lacemen larvae cover themselves in the dead bodies of aphids so that ants don't notice them sneaking in. So our next little, oh, sorry, a little bit quick there. This is probably one I think quite a few people will recognize. So again, pest, pest. Any advance in pest? So I'm sure you all know this one. It's the it's a double pest, Ian. Yes, indeed. It's your cereal leaf beetle, which is a pest of a wide variety of cereals. And it's larvae on the right. It looks like a tiny little slug. And it's meant to kind of look like a bird dropping to avoid um, birds and things from consuming it. So our next one, what do you think about this rather ferocious looking thing, pest or beneficial? Dan thinks beneficial, beneficial in. So most people are agreeing this is beneficial and they are indeed right. This is the ground beetle citrus caraboides. He's got these really long mandibles and quite a narrow um, thorax, and he's specifically designed to delve 
into snail shells where you can haul the snails out of the shells and eat them. So well done all. What about this one? This could be a little bit tricky. So in thinking a pest, is George and Ian, George thinks beneficial, Ian thinks pest. I think I'm trying to catch you out with this one. Um, and it is actually a beneficial, this is a hoverfly larvae. And these guys, again, primarily feed on aphids. So he's actually a beneficial and this is where it gets tricky. And I think this is, might have been what Ian, for example, was thinking. Pests are beneficial for this. Pest, yep. So here we've got a fruit fly larvae, which again is quite an economically damaging pest species. So you can see there's quite a lot of similarity between some of these pests and beneficials. So it's quite important that you get your eye in. Finally, this group of flies. So everyone's perfectly right here. These are marmalade hoverflies. Um, they are called that because they're this glorious orange color like marmalade. They're one of the most abundant hoverflies in agricultural land. And they're, they're pollinators firstly, but they are super pollinators in that when they're larvae, um, the larvae are actually predatory in aphids again. So well done at all. I think you're pretty clued up in your pests and beneficials. So we've got quite a concern at the minute that insects are declining. And that does include some of our beneficial insects. So here we've got population trends from carabid beetles. They're a little bit fluctuating around, um, but overall they are declining. And again, here we've got our hoverflies, which we just heard many of the hoverfly larvae will feed on aphids, so many of them are predatory. Again, these are declining. Now, what concerns me as an agricultural ecologist is we don't have much data in insect populations. And what we don't know is what's happening to some of our other groups. So we don't know how our spiders are faring. We don't know how our lace wings are faring. So it is quite concerning that we do have these declines where we do know the populations. So given our insects are declining, or at least some key groups are declining, why do we, why does this bother us? Well, I'm sure everyone here will know that insects provide a lot of ecosystem services. We do a lot of jobs that underpin agricultural production. So Things like the soil mites, dung beetles are involved in nutrient cycling. We've got our bees, our hoverflies involved in pollination. We've got bioturbulation and our earthworms mixing our soil. We've got a range of natural enemies. We've got ladybirds, lacewings, spiders. Insects also provide food for us, a taxa, and I would say they're very, very beautiful in their own right. At least some are. I don't think anyone could disagree that there's not much 
and life sits as beautiful as a peacock butterfly. So given we do a lot of different jobs, why should we need a diversity of natural enemies? Don't all natural enemies do the same? Well, not really different natural enemies are present in different areas of the crop and at different times of the year. So where we have um, later on in the season where you've got um, grain aphids in the top of the, in the grains, um, you've got pests such as ladybirds, parasitic wasps, and they'll be up in the crop canopy feeding on these grain aphids, feeding on pollen beetles as well. Um, whereas if you look in the centre of the crops, you might see money spiders building these sheet-like webs across. And these spiders will capture any prey items as they fall to the ground. And then finally, at ground level, we've got a whole host of ground active um, invertebrates. We've got ground beetles, wolf spiders, and these will feed on slugs, snails, snail eggs. A lot of the crop pests will pupate and fall to the ground. Um, so things like your some of the fly larvae or pupae fall to the ground and they'll get munched by these ground active predators. And also, um, if an aphid decides it's going to fall to the ground to escape from a ladybird, then it could get trapped in our money spider web or it could get consumed by ground beetles that are active in the surface. So, Research have found where you mix different predators, you get more effective pest control. So how can we support a diversity of different predatory insects? And to learn more about that, you need to think what resources these species require and what areas of your farm could provide these resources. So starting at the beginning of the season, these animals require overwintering habitats and different species overwinter in different habitats. So the, these dense, tussocky, undisturbed grassy field margins will pro provide overwintering for ground beetles, spiders, parasitic wasps, wood areas with hedgerows, with nooks and crannies, or provide um, refuge for hoverflies and ladybirds. And then as these species emerge, quite often while the larvae are predatory, the adults are actually feeding on nectar and pollen. So that would include your parasitic wasps and your hoverflies. So the first thing they need is an early season floral resource. So fruit trees um, can be important, willow trees. Quite often these early season resources are woody tree species. Hedgerows as well, um, hawthorn, blackthorn, these kind of open flowers are easily accessed by wasps and hoverflies. But they need these open flowers throughout the whole period they're active. So here we have a lot of our umbelliforms, a lot of these white flowers like common hogweed, angelica, and navy dockside daisy. These Open flowers will pro provide um, forage for your parasitic wasps and your hoverflies throughout the season. Then perhaps it, you might think you don't want aphids, but at certain times of the year, aphids can help support your populations of your natural enemies outside your crops. So it can be quite good to have these aphids present, for example, you have sycamore aphids um, that are very abundant in sycamore tr 
trays, you've got black bean aphids that not only forage in beans, but also on species such as creeping thistle. So providing um, aphids will help support your population. So when the, the cereal aphids actually start migrating into the crop, you've already got a strong population of pests there already. So generally we think a strong population of predators, sorry, they are already, because our predators have been um, supported by, for overwintering, for alternative sources of forage, both as adults and as larvae. So in general, if we have a diversity of habitats, we can hope to also have a diversity of predators. And of course, that habitat diversity will support a wide range of other insects such and wide, wider wildlife. Okay, thank you. So I think Henry's going to now speak about IPM also. Henry? Great, thank you, Lorna. Um, yes, I think uh, Henry is with us. Um, I just wonder before we go to Henry, um, we're just going to put up the last poll because after Henry, we've got our last speaker, uh, Julian, on grain markets. So if we put up um, um, uh, the, the last poll, um, this one is really asking about marketing and what percentage of your wheat crop will you have marketed uh, ahead of harvest? Uh, you may not do anything. Uh, you may do uh, considerably more. Uh, just uh, give us something to digest. Okay, thank you for that. And um, thank you, Lorna. I, I'll hold off any questions for you perhaps um, until the end, uh, and then we can combine them with any that people might have for, for Henry. But uh, if I can introduce Henry, Henry's a research fellow and lecturer in crop protection uh, and, and been doing a lot of work, I believe, Henry, on the development of the IPM model um, to make it more uh, attractive and useful to Scottish farmers. Brilliant, thanks, Mark. Um, Mark, can you see my uh, my screen? Yes, that's fine. Yeah, brilliant. Okay, so today I'm going to talk to you about IPM practices on Scottish arable farms. Integrated pest management is a holistic approach to pest management, which aims to maximize uh, profitability and productivity whilst minimizing any detrimental uh, mental impacts of crop production on the, the local environment. So this is roughly how we'd structure an IPM program. Uh, the emphasis is on prevention as opposed to intervention. And these are Broadly speaking, these are sort of the steps we might take. So the preventative measures, looking at crop rotation using resistant varieties, and then we get into the identification and detection and monitoring of those pest levels. And when I say pests, I mean any harmful organisms that includes diseases and weeds, as well as invertebrate pests. Then looking at the interventions, we're maximizing mechanical and biological uh, control measures uh, and using pesticides only when absolutely necessary. And then crucially, after we've got um, the, those interventions sorted, we'll move on to the, the evaluation phase, which is very important for IPM. So knowing what you're doing, why you're doing it, and reviewing that uh, strategy is, is crucial if you're looking to improve your IPM uh, practice on farm. To that end, um, we've created uh, these IPM plans. Um, so you can get down on paper um, what you're doing, why you're doing it, and use that as a, a, a tool to facilitate discussion with your main crop protection advisor. We have these plans available for arable crops and also for grassland at the moment. They're all available in the Plant Health Centre Scotland. As well as being a tool to facilitate discussion, it also acts as a very good data collection tool for ourselves to establish baselines for the, the amount and the type of IPM being practiced. It'll also uh, allow us to identify any um, particular issues or topics that could hopefully be remedied with uh, research and development and knowledge um, exchange activities going forward. It only takes about 20 minutes to complete, so I'd like to urge you all to please go there and, and complete one if you haven't done so already. 
Over the next few slides, I'm just going to present some of the, the data and the analysis we've conducted on the first couple of hundred IPM plans collected so far this year. So the IPM score is a score out of a maximum of 100, um, which has been uh, agreed upon by uh, a, a whole host of stakeholders, largely farmers or agronomists, practitioners of IPM. What we've uh, found uh, in Scotland anyway, um, is that there's a direct correlation between the, the size of the arable area and IPM score. So those um, um, farmers that have a larger arable area, typically speaking, are scoring more highly on, on the IPM metric. We also found that those farmers that perceive themselves to be more familiar with IPM practices are also more likely to adopt IPM to a higher level as assessed by the IPM score. And this makes sense because if you're looking to adopt IPM practices uh, and um, to a very high level, uh, then first you must gather the knowledge uh, behind, and the, behind the, and the rationale behind those practices so that you can successfully implement them. We looked at various other um, IPM strategies uh, and, uh, sorry, I was having a problem with my machine then. Um, we looked at various other things, including farmer age, which we found had no bearing on IPM score. Um, but we did find that the farmer's level of education, so the number of qualifications they have related to farming, has an impact on their IPM score. So with every additional qualification, around about five points are being awarded uh, on the IPM scale. So um, whether that be a diploma, a degree, or, or basis certification, all of these things uh, are gonna in increase your ability to critically evaluate your IPM program and make the necessary ch changes to increase adoption levels. So if we can increase farmer familiarity with IPM and, and uh, increase their qualifications with, uh, around crop protection, we can um, uh, potentially increase IPM score. But it's important to note where farmers are going for their information source around IPM. Um, this chart here shows uh, the different sources of information are ranked highly by farmers and their IPM scores along the horizontal axis. And you'll see those that are citing membership uh, levies, research organizations, independent agronomists, um, and crop walks and open days. Well, they're all scoring quite highly compared to those farmers that um, are indicating that other farmers uh, are one of their main sources of IPM advice. This is perhaps because um, these other farmers are acting as middlemen in the process. Um, so rather than uh, going directly to those experts to get that IPM advice, receiving it secondhand is obviously less than ideal. We've got a new project at the moment, uh, kind of funded by the Plant Health Centre, in which we'll be um, telephoning uh, farmers and agronomists to understand where they get their information from. Uh, and find out what pests and disease uh, they think um, most likely to threaten their crops, what informs decision making and the need for interventions. So we'll be creating these networks so we can look at the flows of information to and from agronomists and farmers and the outputs will be bespoke to Scotland. So if you do get a phone call from Ipsos Mori in the next few weeks, please do respond. It'll only take about 15, 20 minutes of your time and the information will be really valuable to us. And and as a result, uh, yourselves, hopefully. So time for a quick question now. Um, I'd like you to stick something in the chat box. To, what is your most effective disease control measure? If you had to pick one, would it be rotation, cultivations, variety, fungicides, or something else? Um, so please stick something in the chat box uh, and uh, we'll perhaps um, review that at the end of the session. For the information source to be providing valuable advice, it must be based on impartial uh, evidence. 
Um, and that's why we conduct uh, a whole host of uh, serial IPM trials at SIUC. So we're looking at different combinations in fungicide rates, products, timings, with varieties, with bio biologicals such as elicitors, fertilizer programs, tillage regimes, sowing dates, so that you can understand not only how these uh, control measures um, work in isolation, but whether there can be any synergies that we can realize by combining the different IPM components into the same program. I'm just going to present some of those trials data now. And um, so this is a, a spring barley trial where we've looked at the interaction between a variety and fungicide timing. It's kindly funded by the Mains and Lawson Trust, and um, this project is run by Ian Bingham. So they looked at two different varieties, one more resistant than the other to Rhynchosporium. And, and they're testing whether actually uh, a T1 and a T2 is needed in, in all um, situations. So this was done over multiple sites over multiple years and all but one site in one year um, at the T2, so a, a spray at uh, booting was sufficient in controlling disease. It was only in 2019 at our Lanarkshire site, if, uh, even though there was no disease on the resistant variety fairing, on Concerto, there was an advantage of that two spray program, but this is just one site season out of I think 12. Um, so if we have a resistant variety and, and we don't have uh, much, if any, uh, Rhynchosporium in the crop, and it's not looking wet over the next few weeks post the, the um, uh, the T1 application, then there's a good um, argument to say that perhaps you don't need that, that T1 spray. We're also doing similar trials in, in winter barley as well. So we're looking at the, the number of applications, uh, fungicides, whether from a zero to a three spray program. And we look at two varieties, one more resistant, another to, to Rhynchosporium. In this trial, and we had um, two treatments, uh, the sowing date was about a month apart. And we found that on average, the greatest fungicide need was in the early sown susceptible varieties, which mirrors what we see in winter wheat. And um, that Fiona presented some of that data earlier in um, this session. You can see here that tower, the more susceptible um, variety uh, suffered when quite dramatically in terms of its yield when untreated and, and when sown early. And that was largely due to ramularia and uh, tan spot in the, the most diseased years, 2019. Last year, um, the evidence suggests you could have got away with just a T1 application because of the drought that we had it curtailed a lot of disease early on. Um, so thinking about the levels in the crop and the season we're having, the varieties you've, you've you're growing and when you sow them is all information that can be used to create a better and uh, more informed on IPM program. Something else we're also looking at is the effect of tillage regime on um, fungicide requirement in different varieties. So we've got the same varieties again, Surgeon Tower, and the same fungicide programs. This will allow us to compare um, fairly easily between trials. There's three different tillage regimes, so direct drill, direct drill with infected uh, straw added, um, and then a plow treatment. We're still in the early days of these trials, which are being conducted at two sites, uh, at uh, Doug Christie's farm in Leven, and also at the Hutton site in Dundee. But a couple of weeks ago, I was out there scoring and um, looked at least uh, at this early stage um, when looking at rhynchosporium levels, there was slightly high levels where we've got the straw added and, and, and higher levels as well under the plow treatment that when we didn't use the fungicide. Interestingly, at this early stage, it appears that that T1 fungicide has been more effective in the plow treatment compared to the, the direct drill. Part of that could have been because uh, of a little bit of uh, ingress of weeds in some of the direct drill sites, particularly brimes. So to summarize, all farmers have adopted IPM to some extent. There's a big range in that level of adoption. The higher IPM adopters um, are more familiar with IPM practices, uh, are typically of a larger farmed area, have more qualifications related to agriculture, but crucially, they are actively seeking IPM and knowledge rather than passively receiving it through uh, popular press. 
for example, or middlemen. It's important that IPM advice is clear, consistent, and evidence-based. Uh, and um, one final thought I'd like to add is that IPM adoption is the responsibility of all stakeholders, and um, whether that be processes, consumers, everyone in the supply chain can potentially influence levels of IPM being practiced on farm. Um, so it's important that um, that awareness is is um, is maintained. And I'd like to finish there. Thank you, Henry. Um, I suppose I don't know whether it's a valid comment, but in the in the defence of smaller farmers, are they disadvantaged just because they haven't got the, the diversity of sort of uh, different um, um, habitats that, that that larger farmers might have? Do you find that, or is that uh, not perhaps a, a legitimate uh, point? No, I think it is. I mean, if you've got uh, fewer fields or fewer different types of soil, then your potential ability to grow different crops is, is restricted. And there can be all sorts of uh, restraints on the farm, the farming business can, that can lead to that lower IPM score on average. And it may very well be that those smaller farms, smaller businesses, uh, are less willing to buy in independent advice uh, and may not even use an agronomist at all, which we've shown is, uh, is detrimental to IPM score. Um, so yeah, there are lots of uh, permutations there and it, it's a very complicated beast, IPM. Yeah, difficult one to put the finger on. Um, okay, well, thank you for that. We'll come back to you um, with some questions if we've got time. Uh, our last presentation uh, is from Julian Bell. And um, Julian, I wondered if, uh, well, Craig, do we have the poll result before Julian uh, kicks off? Okay, so uh, that's interesting. I find that interesting. That's, that's, I don't know how you feel about that, Julian. That's quite a high percentage. Whether that's... Um, just because the market's so strong and farmers are perhaps wanting to buy in to what has been a high market in the in the in the worry that it might fall. Um, but um, uh, I'll hand over to you, Julian, uh, and um, perhaps you'll give us a, your take on the market looking forward. Thanks, Mark. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, well, that's really interesting. It's it's really good to get uh, a bit of a handle on what people are thinking. That's it's probably further ahead than I've seen it uh, in these sort of discussions for a while. Yeah, actually, yeah, so. yeah. Um, and yeah, it's we've had consistent forward prices have been good for for a while. Um, so yeah, really interesting. Now, so obviously a huge amount of. Um, I will just share my slides and my video. Yeah, hi, hi everyone. So I'll just two seconds. I've got a few slides to share. Just make sure that's working okay. Uh, that's come up. Does it come up okay? Yes, you can see that. That's fine. Great. Thank you. So, yeah, so that's some, some, some very active marketing there. Um, I mean, yeah, clearly the prices have, have, have really shot up, um, you know, but I think it's just, well, we'll show in a minute, obviously, that there's a huge amount of work goes on over the year to grow the crops um, and the pricing, uh, obviously that people are taking control of their pricing, which is, is very encouraging. Um, you know, actually pricing the crop up ahead of time and helping hit budgets and things like that. So, because as you'll, well, you're aware anyway, but you'll see there's things all over the world that are um, that been pushing prices certainly up for the last wee while, as we most liked it, uh, we, just earlier this week or last week actually. Um, so, but yeah, there's still fundamentals are pretty reasonably, or pretty strong, pretty positive for, for the grain price. But we're at that key time every year. Uh, I kind of slightly dread this time in terms of looking at the market because we're we're just sort of a week, week or two away from starting to see how the crops are coming in uh, around the world. It's just the first uh, crops in the US and one or two places coming in, but we're just starting to see what, uh, the next week or two, what what they're starting to look like around the world. So, um, yeah, anything could happen at this time of year. So let's just quickly, just I'm trying to keep it very fairly simple. It's a short slot this week, but why have grain prices shot up? Uh, so just a quick look at some of those things, and you know what what should we be looking at in the next uh, month or so? 
to give us uh, a bit of a direction. You know. So, yeah, it's, that's a pretty straight line, more or less, increase in price that we've had since the early, maybe the turn of the year, just to end of just before Christmas, we start picking up. Um, you've had 50 odd pounds on the wheat price compared to a year ago. Barley is very similar. Now, this market, this talk is obviously about wheat, but actually, the rapeseed is a really critical one. And I would think, I would say, is probably the thing that makes the current run more durable than it might be because that's that's a symptomatic of issues both in the rate markets but also soya and soya and maize are compete for the same land so if soya is really strong farmers are going to favor soya uh, and that's really part of the reason why uh, the, the, the maize price which we'll come on to in a minute is, is being so strong so although we are talking about grain uh, they're certainly linked to the oil seeds so that's that's a major increase uh, in the last year. If we look just to look at the global basis, you've got um, these are this whole USDA information. It was just revised uh, just a few weeks ago. This is looking at world production, usage, and stocks. Now the green one is production. So yeah, you think on the face of it, 77 million ton increase in crops being forecast. Um, so that you think would be pretty negative for the price. Usage is expected to go up 54 million tonnes. Um, but actually, stocks are only going to rise 7 million tonnes because we have been, you said, actually being ahead of demand last year. So we actually had to, <laughs> to try and catch back up to where we were. So a small increase in stocks, but when you convert it to stocks to use ratio, so stocks are going up, uh, sorry, the use is going up. Stocks use is coming down. So we were 99.8 days of usage uh, last year, and it's looking at 98.5. So that seems, well, that's quite a small sort of drop, but it is a steady decline from where we were, you know, even three years ago, 106 days in 2019. And clearly, we're quite a long way back from 2016. We'll, yeah, we'll go on to this in a minute, but there's some key changes. Well, China is a critical one. They started buying, particularly maize, which they really hadn't been doing. Uh, but they're starting to look like a structural change in China that they will need to start bringing maize most years, and particularly from the US. So that's that uh, that gives quite a bit of optimism to the to the maize price. Um, yeah, and if you look at the stocks, Taylor two halves. Wheat had really been climbing very strongly, actually starting to sort of stabilise. So there's sort of a bit of an imbalance in the meat market, but uh, that is coming off the high high stock to use ratios that saw just two or three years ago. So it's coming down a little bit, but it's the feed grains that are clearly driving the price rises. Um, and that's the lowest stocks, uh, stocks to use. It's lowest for seven years in the feed grain market. And this here is just showing that what's the big difference is what's happened to the US corn price. So it's, it's risen around 50 pounds. I say it was a little bit weaker last week or so, but um, partly because it was, um, the weather was looking a little, or the forecast certainly been a bit better for the US. It had been pretty hot and dry and they're expecting more rain in some of the key states. But their maize condition crop has been going down, the condition of their maize crop. So at the end of this, third, well, just a few days from now, 30th of June, and by a week, it'll be, there's another report from the US of the conditions. So the conditions of the US corn in the next few weeks is going to be very important because it had been way too hot and dry in some key states. And this, this is silking that's coming up in the next early July. So, yeah, literally, as I say, this time of year, almost anything can happen. But if, if, the, if that rain doesn't come and it does stay hot, hot and dry and they expect, then, yeah. That's pretty positive for that uh, maize price, but yeah, as as you're aware, it's it's so sensitive at the moment, and the, some of the positions I think were taking a bit of profit uh, last week, technical trading, but yeah, everything to play for as you as you say. Um, so quick summary, I think I think probably covered a lot of things. I suppose the main opposite corollary of this is what's happening in Europe. Conditions are pretty good here. There's been better forecasts for parts of uh, Russia and uh, Ukraine and the EU. So yeah, it's, I think the big change for us is probably going to be 
better better green output on this side of the Atlantic, uh, and that might moderate things. Uh, but it's not showing up in the prices particularly at the moment. Um, well, let's look a bit closer to home, the UK. This is, um, I think, this is relatively uh, well. I mean, of course, this is just showing that our winter crop air is rebounded, which 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 the market sort of factoring in. Um, so, so much more wheat was put in the ground. It was a horrendous part part of the winter, early autumn, late autumn was really really bad. But um, crop conditions seem to be improving uh, relatively good now across certainly some parts of the UK and Scotland. So, um, when we look at um, the just a second, I can actually see my slide. But, oh, sorry. Um, yeah. We should get a good rebound, terrible crop last year, nine and a half million tonnes. We should be over 14, 14 and a half, something like that. Um, but really, because the stocks are so, so low going into the end of this year, or just as we speak, incredibly low stocks that we're going to need to rebuild them. <laughs> and um, even a relatively... Even if that, those yields are a bit higher than, than we've got here, certainly the UK is looking really tight. So pretty similar to this year where we've really been looking at imports to, to plug the gap. Um, yeah, there will be more wheat around, but not not so different. We're largely going to be drawing importing wheat uh, or grain, certainly into the UK, uh, and not uh, exporting. So that that's obviously going to potentially support our premiums unless we have exceptional yields. And what I haven't really factored, what I haven't actually factored into this is that the, if the Virgo, the ethanol plant, is expected to restart because the UK has moving, it was moving to 10% blending of ethanol. So again, if that it does come as online as it, as has been sort of stated, uh, then that will just potentially strengthen our own domestic demand. So again, that all suggests unless we have incredibly good yields that will. The conditions here could be relatively similar to this year in terms of being relatively short of, of green. Scotland, it all looks actually very similar. Um, but the winter crop area anyway, looks very, very similar uh, to and the current level. So your poll there was suggesting things are quite, um, quite good conditions for crops. Um, and just to, sort of, yeah, just to show, so 2021, it might only just be a tiny bit lower in terms of winter wheat yield area. The yield could be just um, very quite similar on trend, but actually, if it really is as good as we think, then maybe it'll be higher. Plus, maybe it could be fifty or hundred thousand tons higher than we've got here. But yeah, we've got to see uh, how this crops actually fare. Um, but just to state what's actually really been supporting prices here is that the distilling wheat. Demand for distilling wheat has it's been very strong. Something like an extra 80,000 tonnes that we've used in the last few months compared to the year before. And that's because we, wheat is actually good value against maize coming in. So again, it's the world market feeding through to sort of underpin our own prices here. Uh, and it's actually bumped Scotland. We had been running a bit of a discount to England, but that's, that's gone. We're now at a premium back to sort of where we usually were. I mean, quite a strong premium at the moment over England because the distillers are running and they're taking wheat, not 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 so much maize. You can see why <laughs> the distillers are you know, the premium for new crops still over fifty pounds delivered, which is a tremendous um, incentive to use uh, local wheat. And it's the wheat is the two things that drive Scottish wheat prices or biggest things are if we get wheat in the autumn, so that tends to to, to give us a good supply. And what happens to distilling? Uh, distilling at the moment is, is, is clearly taking these. So you can see whatever happens in the next, um, well, next two to three months with with the world grain crops. Um, you know, if this if this current high price continues, then uh, clearly we're going to be in the same boat. The distillers are going to keep 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 hoovering up Scottish um, wheat. So yeah, so that just really just summarizing that, summarizing now. Um, we're so linked to the world market. It's the maize is absolutely everything at the moment. Uh, it's, it's the stocks are coming down for maize. It's at the absolute crucial time for the US corn belt. It has been too hot and dry. The next few weeks, you know, there'll be a new report in about a week's time. Uh, conditions have been going down for those crops. 
Um, so, and even wheat, although it's still well supplied, um, the stocks are coming down. If we look closer to home, yeah, I think our crops do seem to be looking pretty good. Um, but we're probably still going to be an importer um, because of this year. Um, and yeah, closer to home, distilling is making a huge difference. If they're using Scottish wheat, you can see that in the premium uh, and the price at the moment. Now, of course, <laughs> we don't want to get too carried away. Um, there are issues. We will have a hard wheat crop, so if it is particularly good, then of course that may be uh, it may affect prices. Um, you know, and there should be more maize getting planted around the world. I think the, the issue is this high price of oil seeds because it is giving farmers an alternative because soya prices are really high. So, and that's in years where grain prices have been really elevated it's because two things have been short at the same time, both the feed and in a, and oil seeds. Um, so that's, um, that's pushed us to where we are now. Um, yeah, so at the moment, unless we get particularly good yields, uh, you know, we've got good demand for distilling. So, so that's really the main sort of factor in the market. It's just a difficult to, to be sure, a difficult point in the year. Uh, and you've, you've all sort of deciding, certainly a fair bit sold, um, but a huge amount could, 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 could go on in the next few, a few weeks. So a hell of a lot to be looking at on those markets. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Julian. Um, I'm, I'm conscious we're running tight on time. So, um, yeah, I mean, it does make you wonder <coughs> if you're a brave man to perhaps sell crop uh, 22, uh, 2022 harvest uh, on the back of such strong prices. <laughs> It'd be interesting to see uh, how, how long this run lasts. Um, uh, and actually interesting that, you know, global um, uh, impacts on our on our local market to such a high degree, being that we're such a small country. Um, just coming back to uh, uh, Henry Creason's poll, I think um, rotation was a, a popular answer, Henry. Um, but we'll um, we'll we'll just uh, have a couple of uh, minutes left um, for any questions to the panelists. Um, I have one question. Um, that uh, I was going to ask, and there seemed to be uh, a query about um, uh, a reluctance on the part of those in charge of the recommended list to give more weighting to resistance. Any comments? And that was from Angus McDowell. Um, Fiona, would you like to pick up on that? Yeah, no, it's a really interesting point. And I mean, obviously, the RL system is you know huge and expensive. But we're looking at ways with the HDB where we could reanalyze in different ways, because the way it's done at the moment where you retain older varieties and do the statistics actually masks some of the useful varietal effects. So there are quite simple ways you could vastly improve um, the value of resistance in how you present the data at no great cost, which would be a win-win. And looking at ways where you could also extrapolate between sites, um, which would certainly help us in Scotland. So it's a really active conversation and one that, you know, I think we're all, you know, it's self-evident and that's a really useful way forward. Thank you. And um, just a quick question on IPM. Uh, the, the new um, scoring system that seems to be coming in, do, do we think that's going to become something that um, might be uh, a requirement? Um, it's a sort of a tick box at the moment. And, and do you think it might link into the carbon agenda? Um, Henry, do you have a view on that? Um, I think it's... Uh... So, uh, more than a tick box at the moment. It's a, it's a useful tool and, and these things will continually develop. So at the moment we've got them for arable and grassland. We're working on ones for specialist horticulture as well. And um, the IPM score, I, I don't know if we'll ever see subsidies related to an IPM score. It's more about uh, sort of, uh, the person, the farm, um, and trying to improve their level of IPM uptake to show an increase rather than um, something that you'd be um, potentially directly rewarded for anyway. But I could certainly see in the future it being integrated with a carbon calculator and potentially some um, 
on farm rec uh, recording software or something like that so that ideally it would be in one one place and, and that record keeping which is an important process and we don't want uh, to create more work for farmers when it comes to record keeping so if it was all done in one system that would be ideal going forward yeah I don't okay. know if Fiona has any other comments on that no, I mean, it's obviously part of current quality assurance things, and there will be, just to give a shout out to Arable Scotland uh, on the 29th, there'll be a session there on IPM where we're deliberately looking at what the future direction is. And I do think it will, ultimately, we will have to combine the kind of net zero targets with IPM thinking. So we don't have all the answers, but a, a good conversation on that next week might help. Great. Okay. Well, we'll 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 close the webinar there. The final slide is really uh, just to say, please do fill in the event surveys. Um, there is a fifty-pound voucher available, uh, and if you do require basis and Rosso points, uh, if you can uh, forward your number, name, and postcode to Karen Little at sac.co.uk, uh, we'll endeavour to register uh, from you. Um, these event surveys are important. Please do take time to send them back. Uh, it helps us shape uh, how we can better support Scotland's agricultural community. Uh, so your feedback is valuable. Uh, I think that's all we have to say, other than just to highlight that on Thursday this week, we have our second part of the, these two webinars on winter and spring barley. And next week, Tuesday the 29th, uh, as Fiona was saying, uh, 10 a.m. to 8 p.m. looks an exciting webinar, uh, covering off a lot of ground, hopefully, um, one, one not to miss, and uh, is Arable Scotland. Uh, thank you for listening. Uh, thank you to the panellists, and uh, we'll see you again.